Shadows of Evil is the second last map in Treyarch's perfect quintet. It's one of Treyarch's most ambitious to ever release, and as the first Zombies map made purely for next-gen consoles, it was also the first truly polished quest-styled map. Shadows of Evil is Treyarch's Mona Lisa. It was the map they created to show off just how technically sound they had become. The map draws heavy inspiration from the formula that had been established in Black Ops 2 through Origins and Mob of the Dead, but some ideas can be seen dating all the way back to Doris. Yet while drawing heavily on these old concepts, Concepts, it still manages to find new inspiration and feel creative. Shadows has fantastic graphics, an immersive storyline, a beautiful setting, a perfect soundtrack, and tons of solid content. And as the on-disc map for Black Ops 3 Zombies, it's also one of the most played and recognizable maps to this day. And while it is now considered to be one of the greats, for a very long time, Shadows actually saw a lot of dislike from fans. And I would go so far as to say that Shadow's initial release was received worse by the community than Transit. The map that is so revered today was disliked by so many more long ago. And so today we will be looking at why despite Shadow's being so fundamentally sound, it had such a shaky release. And so, welcome back to Zombies Retrospective. My analytics show that 53% of you are not subscribed. And so if you are new around here or watching this as a reaction, please, Go over to the channel, hit that subscribe button, ring the bell, and with that said, let's get into it. Shadows of Evil is to Mob of the Dead, as we will come to find Origins is to Dreisendrak. It starts with a relatively linear quest to open Pack-a-Punch, which feels very reminiscent of Mob's opening plane step. You've got a straightforward path which requires you to open up various sections of the map in Beast Mode. Beast Mode is a play off of Afterlife, with the ritual pieces you're unlocking very obviously resembling the barriers we see in Mob's first steps. There's things like doors, perks, and other locks objects which perfectly resemble afterlife features. It's almost identical to Mop. But where SOE finds variance is on the ritual step. The ritual step is the key component and most defining feature of Shadow's opening act, and it actually draws straight from Origins. It's literally a redesign of the Origins generator step. You start a sequence that has special enemies spawn on you until a time elapses. Completing these four rituals and then a final similarly styled but more intense fifth ritual then opens up Pack-a-Punch. It's Origins but with extra steps. And this is a neat little trick we will come to see Treyarch actually do a lot in Black Ops 3. The underlying mechanics of this opening sequence are almost identical to Mob of the Dead, but Shadows manages to feel new. See, imagine if you were simply collecting the ritual pieces, like how you did on Mob. This would be an identical copy. If the map had played like this, it would have felt bland and uninspired. But what makes Shadows feel so unique are the inclusion of rituals. Shadows draws off of two old concepts, but blends them together seamlessly to create what feels like a new and unique experience. And we will actually see the exact same thing, but in reverse on Dorizon Drac. I think overall this is a really effective way to reuse content. And Shadows actually draws on Mob in more ways than its opening sequence. The map plays on a similar theme of atonement for sins, just like we see with our Mob crew. But again, Shadows manages to make this idea feel fresh. The Shadow Man takes hold of the map's narrative on round one and never stops until you turn that slimy weasel into a giant gummy worm. He plays on the guilt of your four characters, and so they cooperate with him. He's deviously charming and is by far the best character on the map. And he embodies a difference from Mob. On Mob of the Dead, the atonement theme is very much background noise, and there isn't really a figure that embodies the ancient evil or guiding force of the map. And I think that's why Shadows manages to be different. This time we have a face to the antagonist of the map rather than it simply being a generic unknown evil force. There's also huge similarities between the Mob and Shadows crew. First of all, they're both celebrity casts. And on top of that, Shadows is basically the third of the dead map, but just with a rebranded name. Also, these two storylines are actually connected. We hear mentions of Finn O'Leary's whiskey, among other things. 
and they even take place in a similar era. But with this in mind, I think that the Shadows crew is not Treyarch's best lineup. As a whole, this crew feels less deep and more one-dimensional than the previous two crews we have met, Mob and Primus. The characters undergo very little development, and I think this is probably the weakest aspect of Shadows. Floyd is supposed to be the one-dimensional tough guy, and he is. But sadly, he's just overshadowed by the significantly more intimidating Billy Handsome. He's uninteresting and really adds little dynamic to the four beyond being the stale archetypal big guy. Nero is a very eccentric character, and while I find him to be well fleshed out, I also find him to be annoying at times. There's a lot of exploration in his guilt, which is well done, but I just don't find him enjoyable to play as. A lot of the lines are very over the top, and hearing them multiple times in a game gets stale. Overall, I think Nero is a good character, but I prefer to keep my distance from him. Now, Jessica Rose is for certain my favorite of the four. She kills her slimeball manager because he was blackmailing her, and while it may be unjustified, it at least makes sense. She is a bit of a cliche as the young female trying to make it as an actor, but we do actually get to find out that she is deeper than that. I think she is by far the most realistic and fully fleshed out character. Plus, she does have one of the most classic lines in all of Zombies. Hey, you. And lastly, we have Jackie Vincent. Probably one of my least favorite characters in Zombies, Jackie hijacks every moment with very narcissistic comments and is simply not fun to play as. He's meant to be an egomaniac, but I find the dialogue gets very annoying after a while. While his actions are believable, they're not relatable, and I just never found myself caring about him. And so as a group of four, I think overall the Shadows crew fails. On their own, they're generally uninteresting, and as a whole, they fail to find synergy to bring their parts into something greater. We see little character development, and most of their exploration only comes from the Shadow Man's lead. I think Mob does a much better job with the Atonement theme because it allows the characters to come to their own conclusions. For example, when Weasel or Sal pack a punch, they give us amazing personal insights. It just feels a lot more impactful and earned when they realize or try to deny how awful they are. But if there's one part Shadows excels on more than any map, it's setting. This map is one of Treyarch's most detailed and beautiful. It's a 1940s alternate Chicago full of bright lights and one of the greatest soundtracks in Zombies history. Like seriously, snakeskin boots, the apocalypse averted Pack-a-Punch music, and over 10 custom round shaped songs. Zombies has always gravitated towards metal. Let's do it! and it's so impressive of what a great job they did with jazz. But Shadows also has a beautiful aesthetic. Mob is somber, dark, and evil, whereas Shadows is lively. From the Footlight District's burlesque building to the main junction and Pack-a-Punch room, it's literal perfection. And all of this beauty is then layered with Lovecraftian monsters littered everywhere throughout the map. Cthulhu statues to charge your apothic an egg, giant tentacle margwa monsters, an antagonist who turns out to be a tentacle monster, oh, and a skyline with a giant octopus monster. To combine these two elements is absolutely bizarre, and that only makes its success more effective and compelling. Shadows of Evil is the best looking original zombies map, and it's not easy. Close. You know what else blows my mind on Shadows? It's design. I will go out on a limb here and say that Shadows has the best layout of any zombies map ever. Weighing in at around 23 Nocturne Totems, Shadows is a respectively big map, but its layout makes it very easy to navigate. Also, hi Lex and hi Noah. Shadows has got four unique sections, plus the Pack-a-Punch area down below. And so despite it coming close to the size of Origins or Mob, getting around this map is a pleasure? Well, no big Treyarch map is a pleasure, but it does the best job. So the middle junction serves as a central hub connecting the three districts along with the rift area down below. This four-way path is the most economical design that any map can realistically have, and we've actually seen its effectiveness before. Doris actually invented this format. 
Literally, teleporter A, B, and C with the middle area being spawn. This design makes travel from the middle area very effective. But each district also has a rift, which then connects itself to the lower area of the map. This then makes travel between any district extremely efficient as well. The tram also serves as a relatively useful piece of transportation. It's not perfect, but compared to the tank from Origins, the bus on transit, or the elevator on die rise, the tram is actually effective. It can save you time depending on where you need to be, and it's also capable of saving you points in the opening sequence. Treyarch has consistently struggled with map layout, and I would argue that this is their best work. Shadows gets a 10 on map design. And oh my god, we haven't even gotten to content yet. So what's actually new on Shadows? While maybe not as much as Origins, Shadows comes packed to the brim with new content. There are so many weird and wacky ideas blended into the map, but it's seamless. Like, for example, the giant tentacle black hole gun wouldn't make a whole lot of sense if it was just a city. But because the city is blended with Cthulhu themes, it feels right at home. So I just want to talk about everything. Now, first of all, we have the only new perk to be featured in BO3, Widow's Wine. Widow's Wine serves almost as a secondary juggernaut, and with zombie speed hit increased in this game, it came at the perfect time. Widow's Wine also serves another function. You know how Black Ops 2 zombies would start walking after round 15? The purpose of this was to make training harder. Well, Widow's Wine is basically an improvement on that old concept. Widow's Wine zombies add an additional obstacle, and so you don't want them. But the additional defense makes it worth it to use the perk. And so this makes Widow's Wine a balanced addition. Instead of forcibly adding in slow zombies unnaturally, it puts the possibility of them in the hands of the player. Train well and you won't need to deal with it. Train not as well and it will still save you. It's a smart addition that keeps this concept in, but it's just blended a little bit more nicely. Also, it's got a great perk jingle. And speaking of which, the jazz-themed perk jingles is yet another well-thought-out detail. Still though, I am a little disappointed in Shadow's overall perk scheme. Four perks is just not enough on this map. Even if you choose to forego Quick Revive, you still have to lose something important. Juggernaug is an essential, and with the map still being quite large, stamina up is a bit of a necessity. This then leaves you with only two slots. Do you want the new Widow's Wine, Speed Cola, Double Tap, or Mule Kick? It's a frustrating choice to have to make, and I wish they had opened up a fifth perk slot, or allowed players to get more than four perks in another way. Another huge addition to the game is Double Pack-a-Punch. Double Pack-a-Punch is a controversial addition, as it makes every single gun equal. On round 100, the Shiva is as effective as the Haymaker, and the Ray Gun is rendered effectively useless. Still though, I think as a whole, Double Pack-a-Punch was a step in the right direction for the series. It opened the game up to later rounds and put less emphasis and necessity on Wonder Weapon. Which is nice, because many maps only have one, and so the other three teammates now get adequate firepower. And on that note, we also did see the most overpowered wonder weapon ever added into zombies. The Tentacle Black Hole Machine. The Apothecate Servant is essentially the perfect 20 out of 20 wonder weapon. The moment you shoot it, all zombies stop attacking you, so it's the perfect safety weapon, but it's also capable of killing lots of zombies. It's basically just an infinite damage acid gat for mob, but with the cost of limited ammo. And because you only get 10 shots of the Marastagua, I actually feel like it's a little bit balanced. You have to use your shots wisely, and so it wouldn't be until Rev where the Apothecate Servant gets ridiculously OP. Shadows also introduces Gobblegum, and while this is a topic worth an entire video, they initially served as a great addition. The classic lineup of Gobblegum are very balanced, providing the player with small but helpful bonuses. Swordflay's increased melee damage is great for early round point hoarding or when combined with a bowie knife. In Plain Sight provides an additional piece of safety and can help with some easter egg steps. An alchemical antithesis this is, is a great high round gum which provides you with unlimited ammo. Sadly, however, it would be Activision's pursuit of micro DLC that would in a large way hurt zombies. Mega Gobblegum were initially intended to act as a 
very limited bonus gum. For a special game, you could pop a perkaholic and get all the perks on the map, for example. But because Mega Gobble Gum were able to be purchased, this effectively made the game pay to win. Worse, however, is that because these gums allowed players to get additional perks, it also stopped Treyarch from adding this as an in-game feature. Most BO1 and BO2 maps have ways to get more than four perks. Red Dig Sites on Origins, The Witch on Buried, Monkeys on Shang, George on Call of the Dead, and pretty much every Easter egg ever. BO3 allows players to get more than four perks as well, but the step required is to steal your mom's credit card rather than doing anything in-game. And so I think most primarily, Gobblegum hurt BO3 in this way. It not only broke the game for people who used them, but it also made Treyarch lazy in the multiple perk department. And it, it, it really hurt my wallet. I spent over three grand on Liquid Divinium, and so I'm still a little bit jaded by my horrible decisions. But Shadows also has a ton of little features. Pods are all over the map, and they serve as a long-term bonus. Wait till they turn purple and you can get some crazy rewards, like free cash, a piece for the Wonder Weapon, or maybe even a Ray Gun. Overall, it's super helpful, and they're a fun and well-integrated addition. Shadows also has some less than useful additions, like the upgrade for Little Arnie's. Little Arnie's are an amazing amazingly useful improvement over the monkey bomb, and while I don't mind the existence of an upgrade, it just always felt like a waste of time. It makes them stronger, but you don't actually need that strength as, again, double pack-a-punch makes every gun a one-shot forever. There are also additional defense items on this map. The shield was transformed into a rocket shield. While the defensive element of this is still great, the rocket boost just felt like an unnecessary gimmick. It's fun, but it doesn't really add anything important. You've also got the Margwa Mask, which makes it so you resist stomps. While effective, it again isn't all that useful. By the time you're ready to complete the process to get it, you'll likely be strong enough that a Margwa is of no concern. And because it requires you to take time out of your game, it's just another item that isn't really worth the time. Again, none of these things take away from the map, I just don't think you can argue that they added anything. There is one other addition though that is pretty incredible the Civil Protector. By finding three fuses and paying 2,000 points, you essentially summon Robocop to fall from the sky and be your personal bodyguard. He kills enemies, stomps Margwas, serves as an amazing help on the flag step, and can even revive you. This is one of the best features in Shadows, and is a concept that was never utilized this well again. And so lastly, with all that said, we have the Easter Egg. Black Ops 3 as a whole notes a huge transition in overall game focus. World at War and Black Ops 1 were almost entirely focused on gameplay. There was storyline, but it was very much in the background, and you really had to go looking for it. Black Ops 2 saw an increase in focus on storyline, but gameplay remained at the forefront. But Black Ops 3 starts to push storyline so that it's really equal with gameplay. And this isn't to say that one formula is better than other, but it's just important to note. What it does do, however, is make the Easter egg of prime significance to the overall success of the map. And so now let's talk about the Shadows EE. The Shadows has a lot of general similarities to the mob easter egg. For both, the first step is a lengthy quest that opens up Pack-a-Punch. But these easter eggs are also similar because their second step requires you to get the map's secondary wonder weapon. On Shadows, most of the easter egg is actually just getting the sword. First you spend a few rounds charging the egg at Cthulhu statues, and this is a direct parallel to getting kills for the Hell's Retriever. On Shadows, you must then take four rounds to kill summon Margwas in various rituals circles around the map. And that's actually most of the easter egg, which again reminds me of Mob. Mob's easter egg is very linear and short, and while Shadows is a bit longer, it's so entrenched in what can be considered just general gameplay that there isn't a whole lot of difference between setting up and actually trying to beat the whole egg. Up to this point, my only complaint with the Shadows egg is that it requires a lot of round progression. To unlock Pack-a-Punch elements, you first need to progress through rounds to recharge your beast mode. Then you can only do one of the four sword upgrade rituals once a round. So again, you'll find the most grueling aspect of this to be round hopping. And then from here, you again get another step that can only be done once a round. And so there are some parallels with Mob here, as Mob's biggest complaint is that the Easter egg is too short and tedious. But despite being so similar, Shadows of Evil does not see this critique very often. And I think this is completely because of the flag step. The flag 
Steph is one of the best gameplay orientated parts of any Easter egg in Zombies history. The step itself is amazing. You must defend a flag while it charges from an endless horde of meatballs as the Shadow Man attempts to thwart your efforts. It's a challenging and engaging step that gets your heart beating, requiring full focus. And really, it's the game changer between what makes Shadows a great Easter egg and Mob not so much. Both lull you into a repetitive sequence, but just as you're getting bored, Shadow slaps you in the face. And if you're caught slipping on this step, you're bound to fail. And so after you finish this, you finally overcome and defeat feed the Shadow Man with the help of the Keepers. It's a really done sequence with a satisfying conclusion, and Treyarch's first attempt at a boss fight. It's not fantastic, but it's also better than <clears throat> some boss fights we should see later. And so then, after destroying the big octopus in the sky, you get a 15 second easter egg that sets the entire stage for Black Ops 3's storyline. It's surprising, enticing, and at the time was brief enough to really hook the community's interest. And I think that's what Shadows does most effectively. It sets the stage for the rest of Black Ops 3 Zombies. But with all this said, how is it then that Shadows was so disliked? Surely it's not perfect, but the thing that Shadows does well are done impeccably. It's got so many elements of thoughtful detail, but the biggest issue that Shadows faced was not actually anything to do with the map in and out of itself. But rather, the problem with Shadows was its placement in the series. Shadows of Evil was the on-disc map, and being as it is, this added an additional responsibility that it did not handle well. Shadows of Evil enacted the mortal sin, and that is that it did not appeal to the casual community. Look, I can go on and on with you guys as hardcore fans about what a masterpiece Shadows is objectively, but realistically, we're all sitting here with 8,000 gobble gum, 800 levels, and countless Easter egg completions, but we don't speak for the casual player. And so Shadows over complication was bad for the community. The Giants, Black Ops 3's only casual map was locked behind a paywall, and so many people only had this to play on launch day. From day one, this alienated a huge part of the community, and despite propping up many YouTubers who could display their mastery at videos, I think Shadows put off a lot of people from ever joining the quote zombies community. It set a tone that was, you're either deeply invested or you're out, and I think this meant that a lot of people were out from the start. Even personally, I had tons of friends comment that at the time they loved seeing me play it but didn't enjoy playing it themselves. For a lot of people, Shadows takes an hour to set up, and if you're looking for a casual zombies experience, well, you're not gonna find it here. Now, this isn't to say that it takes away from the map objectively as a whole, but it does take away from the overall value of Black Ops 3. It was a massive oversight, and I really pray it doesn't happen again in COD 2020. Black Ops Cold War, let's, dude, let's, let's freaking go. It's, it's finally been announced. The danger is real. But with all that said, the greatest stretch of zombies content is undoubtedly this section we are in right now, and we've still got one more map to look at. Shadows, however, was number four of Treyarch's perfect quintet. And really, as it sits, it was near perfect. Shadows drew heavily on Mob of the Dead, but not so much to feel on original. It's the most beautiful non-remade zombies map of all time and has one of the best soundtracks as well. Its blending of HP Lovecraft's Cthulhu and the 1940s is a truly unique setting, and it allowed for the map to seamlessly blend tons of amazing features into a realistic setting. And it's got a fantastic Easter egg that sets the stage for the rest of Black Ops 3 for both our protagonists and the Shadow Man. Shadows of Evil is fundamentally a rework of Mob of the Dead in a very different setting. It took those themes and gameplay elements and improved on them in almost every aspect. Sure, it got to stand on the shoulders of giants, but the focus of this series is to look at the map for what it is in an ode of itself. And in that regard, Shadows is a masterpiece. Very few maps ever manage to strike such a beautiful ambiance, and overall it is one of the most standout maps in Treyarch's entire catalog. My final rating for Shadows of Evil is a 9.8.